You are watching the first lesson for the course People and Cultures of Brazil. This course is going to start out with the question of what makes Brazil unique. Brazil has a very specific racial, historical, economic, cultural, political history that we can explore in many different ways. And it has a very similar history to the United States and other places in the New World. So we're going to be looking at Brazil in a global context and really trying to pinpoint what is so specific about Brazil. Here I just wanted to show you some very basic pictures, some of the most common pictures that you'll see of Brazil. That's Sugarloaf Mountain in Rio de Janeiro, right downtown. You can get there uh, from Copacabana Beach or about 20 minutes from the airport. It is a beautiful town and one place that I have spent more than five years living and I am currently in Brazil as I speak right now. So I am giving you a very first-hand perspective of some of these cultural issues in Brazil. We can also see here on the left-hand side a flag. That's the flag of Brazil. We have a phrase written across it in Portuguese saying ordem in progresso. Ordem is the Portuguese word for order. E is the Portuguese word for and. And progresso is the Portuguese word for progress. Together, that phrase suggests that Brazil is guided by a principle of order and progress. We will learn how to understand that idea, possibly critique it, and apply it in very unique settings. And here I just wanted to point out the map of Brazil. We can see it is very large. It is larger than the United States, larger than the continental United States. At the very least, there's other ways to analyze it, analyze its size and show that its scope, but it is a very large country in general. It has over 200 million people living there. Rio de Janeiro, for example, has almost 8 or 9 million people. Metropolitan area has many more. Sao Paulo has about 16 million people. So Sao Paulo, just to the south of Rio de Janeiro, is a much larger, yet less known city. So it's a very diverse country. There is a huge wealth of geological and environmental resources. We have the Amazon, and we have the subtropics, which is sort of Rio de Janeiro. And then we have some more temperate climates and deserts. So we have a whole variety of different geologies and geographies that we will be looking at throughout the course. Here we can see that there is a very unique colonial history nonetheless, and this is something that we will expand upon in later lessons. But just to imagine the colonial history and the colonial narrative that we have in the United States and how that might have played differently if there were different colonizers and a different land being colonized and a different people were being colonized. And here we see that there was a large indigenous population in Brazil, and there still is, even though it's threatened. And there is sort of this issue of ethnic or racial domination by European whites. And this is something that we can see to this day. So this is what we're going to be doing a lot in this course is referencing the far past to try to understand the future. And we can see that these histories are very much lived and experienced today. So something to keep in mind, something to consider as we are discussing broader topics in the course and broader ideas in the course. We're going to also be looking a lot at Brazilian cinema. It is a cinema tradition that is equal to the United States, one could argue. There are some classic great films, expression of thought and idea and national identity are all very clear in these films. One thing I want to do as presenting these is seeing how we can understand Brazil's current political moment and current cultural moment in terms of a longer history of Brazilian cinema. And as we go throughout the course, we're going to be really looking at some of those broader topics that we see in Brazilian cinema and how they apply to the present. Some of the key course concepts in that respect, and these are things that are seen often in Brazilian cinema, is the idea of inequality based on race and ethnicity, 
as well as economic inequality. Here we have a shanty town, a favela, as they're called, in Brazil, by the name of Rocinha, that's right next to the beach, right next to some of the most expensive real estate in Rio de Janeiro. And this is a community of somewhere between 60,000 to 200,000 individuals that are living in an informally constructed community. So they often did not have permission to construct these from the government, but also the government was not punishing them. The government was more or less letting them do this. So it's a very interesting form of acceptance of poverty that's different than the United States and different in other parts of the world. But we still can see that there's a great deal of oppression. Individuals who experience inequality, whether it's racial or ethnic or uh, economic inequality, we can see that they are often oppressed by individuals, both phys physically oppressed by police violence, as well as excluded from specific cultural representations, specific political opportunities, and specific forms of social recognition. So we'll be studying, describing that, studying that throughout the course. Uh, and then we're going to talk about a culture of hunger or a culture that is used to expressing these kinds of inequalities and these forms of oppression, a form of culture that is focused on understanding what it means to be oppressed and what it means to lack and the specific forms of frustrations that underlie life in Brazil. Much of the representations we see are going to be very highly glossy and sexualized sometimes. Sometimes they're going to be very highly romanticized. They're going to have a very pleasant and compelling image of Brazil. And we can critique that by looking at some of the inequalities and some of the deficiencies that exclude individuals in Brazil. What are some of the things that we can look at? I like to look at the idea of contemporary Brazil in the last few years in terms of fire. I know this sounds probably a little cynical, but there has been some historic fires in Brazil in the last few years. And these have directly tied to how Brazilians see themselves, how Brazilian cultural identity is structured, and how individuals relate to a broader society. On the left, we see the Cineteca, which is a foundation for Brazilian cinema. And I think very ironically, a class based off of Brazilian cinema as an example of Brazilian culture, we have an, a fire that devastated and lost 700 of Brazil's earliest films in 2016. In 2018, we can go to the far right of the scene, uh, the screen, and we can see Brazil's National Museum. So not just the National Film Archive, but the National Museum up in flames. It's a former imperial palace. Once the Brazilian Empire was done, once it uh, was overtaken by a republic in the 1880s, we see that the former imperial residency is turned into a national museum. Some timeless archival imagery, some timeless ecological specimens, some timeless historical documents and treasures were lost in this fire. It was, I believe, one-tenth the size of the Smithsonian, but if you've ever gone to the Smithsonian, you'll see that there is a whole lot of information. One-tenth of the Smithsonian would be a devastation for human history, for humanity. And this was often seen, this fire at the museum was seen as a devastating moment for humanity. Fast forward to 2019, and we see that there is fire raging across the Amazon. This is often associated with deforestation, the expansion of agricultural refineries, agricultural processing plants, agricultural land, people cutting down forests for logging, using it to uh, plant soy, and to raise cattle to export to foreign markets. What did this cause? Massive fires throughout the Amazon that sent a cloud across Latin America. So we have a lot of things happening in Brazil that are based off of fire right at this moment. What does it mean for the country to be suffering these types of losses? 
And one thing we can look at is the current political moment. This is something that is in very rapid transformation right now. Uh, I'll just summarize this very quickly, and we will have opportunities to read about this more throughout the course. But from left to right, we have Brazil's last four presidents. Lula Inácio Lula da Silva was the president of Brazil during the 2000s. His successor, who was of the same political party, a workers' party, a semi-socialist party that was working to dramatically expand Brazil's social safety net, its state-building apparatus, its economic infrastructure, as well as trying to raise people out of poverty and creating a new middle class, were highly successful at achieving such. They expanded the educational state, and they also took advantage of, very coincidentally, a booming economy. One of the largest economic booms in the history of humanity happened in Brazil underneath these two presidents. Unfortunately, in 2016, and this is something we'll be watching in the course, the second president, Gilma, uh, Gilma Rousseff, was impeached by a group of conservative anti-socialist programs or politicians. And her vice president, who was a member of the conservative party, it was a shared ticket. They sort of wanted to make a coalition between the socialists and the conservatives, the economic conservatives. And in the end, this really incentivized impeachment to put the uh, conservative guy in office. And so we have Michel Temer. He was recently uh, left office. He didn't run for re-election. And who did we get in his place? Someone who is roundly considered to be a authoritarian, someone who supports uh, extrajudicial killing of people in the favela of drug dealers, and someone who has systematically gotten rid of environmental regulations, protections for Native Americans, and funding for education programs, the arts, and public housing. So he has systematically tried to undo all the government activities that took place under the two presidencies of Lula and Gilma. Jair Bolsonaro, someone we will be talking about a great deal in this course. So we can see, and this is something we can look at and start the conversation on Brazil, is the conversation about visual representation. One of the first things you'll be watching in the course is a short called Aquarela do Brasil, or Watercolor of Brazil. This is the main character, Zé Carioca. He is more or less the Donald Duck of Brazil. He was designed and promoted by Disney during the 1940s, during World War II, when Brazil and the United States were allies. This is part of Disney's service to the United States, was to promote the common shared cultural and political and social ideals that Brazil and the United States have. So as you watch this, I would like you to consider how Brazil is being presented, how knowing that there's inequality, knowing that there are going to be some social problems in Brazil, how this positive relationship of Brazil to the United States or even Brazil to the rest of the world is depicted by a early set of images from Brazil. And someone that you'll be reading this week and someone who is very central to how Brazilians think about the world is Paulo Freire. You'll be reading his work, or at least the first two chapters of his work, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. This is a classic teaching text. So if you ever go into teaching or education as a field of study or a profession, you will be introduced more to Paulo Freire. I'll let you read the work and talk about it in the discussion for the course, but I'll just go over the basic idea that I really always try to convey with Paulo Freire. He had a method about learning. He really wanted to have students that were critical, that were able to identify social problems in their lives. And he wanted to give 
them the tools to identify these social problems, to gain a literacy of the world, to learn social terms and to learn a vocabulary in a specific context in order to identify social problems that are in the context. So to name problems, and we can see here to name, to reflect, and to act. So Paulo Freire really wanted individuals to learn things so they could name a social problem, so they could be empowered to ask questions about that social problem, and how they can eventually lead themselves to changing or reshaping that social problem. Let me give you an example, and this comes directly from Paulo Freire. Freire was a educator in exile during the 1960s. There was a dictatorship in Brazil, and he was first exiled to Bolivia and then to Chile. These countries at the time did not have universal suffrage, meaning that not everyone was allowed to vote. The people who were allowed to vote were often people who were educated and specifically individuals who could read. Paulo Freire went in and taught people how to read so they could go and vote. But instead of just having that reason, that action, and that effect, he had a very specific intention behind that. He didn't want people just to vote for whoever. He wanted people to understand who was oppressing them, who was causing them problems, who was capable of changing those problems, identifying those people through literacy. So he used specific words. He taught specific words to individuals who couldn't read, such as democracy and inclusion. And these were basic words that were used to help individuals break down text to discuss what they were reading and what they're engaging with. He didn't want people just reading soup cans. He wanted people reading newspapers. He wanted people reading ballots. And he wanted people shaping the world around them. And so we can see here, Paulo Freire named a social problem that was social oppression. We can see that that social oppression was caused by the lack of people being able to read. So we reflected on that problem and we found by speaking with people and by analyzing the world that people not being able to read is the cause of that social problem that we just named. And then we took action. We taught those people how to read. And so we took an action to solve that social problem. I want you to think about this as we talk about any social issue in Brazil or across the globe throughout this course. And I want you to be able to apply this to all the writing that we have in the course. So keep this in mind as we are going through every single assignment and every single uh, test and every single lecture in this course. So how can we discuss Brazil as a social player, as a global player, as a part of a broader globe? Can we compare Brazil with places like the United States or Europe? Uh, and what problems can we find in Brazil and how can we relate them to previous cultural issues that we'll be watching? All these are going to be very driving questions for the rest of the course. And I uh, hope you enjoy and we will be hearing more from each other as the semester goes on.